When I was a child, I used to think a simple and recurring thought all the time. I'm me. I'm me. And there will never be another one like me. Everybody else, no matter how much I love them, isn't me. I'm me, the only one there will ever be. Must have been a nursery rhyme or something. <laughs> And my mother, who's been teaching nursery school and caring for youngsters for the last quarter century or so, will tell you that this is a normal stage of development, that around the age of two, three, a child becomes self-aware, recognizes that he or she is an individual with his or her own set of eyes, his or her own outlook on the world. Be that as it may, I think back often to these earliest days, realizing for the first time that I was who I was, an individual. Maybe you can recall a similar experience. The first time you realized that you were you, that the whole world would have to relate to you as you are. Singular, unique, you. Recently I saw a cartoon making the rounds on the internet. At one point, it seemed that half of my Facebook friends were sharing it with each other. And the cartoon depicted the typical evolution scene, you probably know the one I mean, where there's sort of a tadpole-looking thing at the beginning, and then it becomes some sort of lizard, and then a monkey, and then sort of a knuckle-dragging Neanderthal type, and then finally a man. Well, each one of these stages of evolution had a thought bubble above its head. And for the tadpole and the lizard and the primate and the Neanderthal, it said, the same thing. It said, eat, breed, survive. Eat, breed, survive. Eat, breed, survive. And finally, when it got to the man, the thought bubble changed, and it said, why? <laughs> <laughs> we human beings are gifted with something that, so far as we know, is unique amongst God's creatures. The inborn capacity to ask questions about who we are, what we are, why we are. That early developmental stage that my mother would be more than happy to talk your ear off about, I'm sure, that I am me, very quickly becomes why me? Why now? And what for? And just as quickly it becomes I'm me and you're you. I'm me and you're another. We understand ourselves, but very quickly we begin to understand ourselves in relation to the other. There's one thing that makes us human. It is that inborn ability to recognize ourselves, to recognize the other. Today is Trinity Sunday. And this day in the church calendar is the day when we collectively attempt to recognize the greatest other of all. Today is the day that we try to recognize the very person or persons of God in the Holy Trinity. This is the day when Christian preachers the world over contort themselves into all kinds of positions, trying and failing inevitably to explain the mystery of the Holy Trinity. No small bit of heresy will be preached from pulpits today. Not because the preachers themselves are heretics per se, but rather because they feel that somehow it is their job to present in 15 minutes or fewer a cogent explanation of probably the most impenetrable mystery of the faith. It's desperately tempting to do that. There's a charming novella that was written by the author Graham Green, entitled Monsignor Quixote. It always comes to mind for me on Trinity Sunday. The story involves Monsignor Quixote, a Spanish priest and descendant of the famous knight, and the communist mayor of the small Spanish town in which he resides. Both of them find themselves at odds with their rather diverse constituencies, and they decide to flee the town together in the priest's small car and riding in the back seat is a rather generous supply of the local red wine. So after they've had a, a, a suitably uh, 
generous sampling of this red wine, Monsignor Quixote finds himself in an explaining mood, which uh, happens to preachers after a couple of glasses of wine. Of and he decides that he will explain the doctrine of the Trinity to this communist, atheist, travel companion of his. And so he takes three empty bottles, and he lines them up, and he says, you see, it is three bottles that we have drunk, but only one wine. <laughs> In case you're wondering, that's rather a bad analogy. <laughs> but as analogies go, it's maybe not the worst that I've heard, maybe not the worst that you've heard. There are the famous ones. St. Patrick said that the Trinity was like a shamrock. It's not. Others have said that it's like an egg, that you have the outer yolk, or the inner yolk rather, the outer shell, and then the white in the middle. Three things, one thing, no. Others have said like water. Water can be, can be liquid or vapor or steam and ice. That might be in the right ballpark, but again, no. I once heard from a fairly reliable source that there was a priest of this diocese who once brought an apple up into the pulpit with him and a knife, and he cut the apple into three pieces, and he said, you see, three pieces, one apple. Oof. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that all of these analogies fall short. They fall short in one fundamental way or another to describe just what it is to recognize the very nature of God in three persons. All of these analogies fall short of the Trinity. So what then, you might reasonably ask yourself, is the point of confessing faith in a God whose very nature we will never fully understand? Surely, as Christians, we've become used to having a certain kind of certainty in our faith. After all, we believe that God has acted in a real way within the confines of history, in the person of Jesus Christ, to show us that God is what we proclaim God to be, triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, of course, I'm willing to go that far. And as a believing Christian, I must go that far. But there's something else to believing in God. If we only believed in a God who was understanding, who was just enough like us that we could sort the whole thing out, I'm not sure we'd have a real faith to begin with. And there's something about pondering the nature of the Trinity that is very much like the ponderings I had in my earliest memories. I'm me, could just as easily be God is God. Yet God and I are not two solitudes. We meet. We are in relationship with one another. I am me, but God created me. God sustains me. God sanctifies me, blesses me, loves me, forgives me. I am me, but I can't be me, fully me, without God. And God, too, is in relationship with me, with you, with creation, and within God's self. God is God. And the Trinity is both God's interior being and God's external being. Who God is and what God is. God creates the Father. God redeems through the Son. God sanctifies through the Holy Spirit. God is in the kind of relationship that manifests itself as a great dance. And perhaps that's the only successful metaphor that we have. A dance with three partners moving symbiotically with one another across an infinite dance floor. Three partners who dance on their own but perfectly with each other. Dancers in their own rights, but dancers together. The dance of the Holy Trinity. But even that metaphor, which has existed for centuries, 
which even has a fancy Greek name, Heracleresis, <laughs> tried and tested as it is, falls short in some ways, I'm sure. It falls short as all metaphors for the Trinity, from wine bottles to shamrocks, are bound to be. But perhaps that's not all bad. Perhaps it is in the pondering of holy things, however imperfectly, that slowly the capacity for holiness is built up in each of us. Just as it is that in pondering our own selves, knowing ourselves to be ourselves, I'm me, that helps us to get in touch with who we really are, helps us to define ourselves in relationship to another. If our hearts take delight in thinking on God, perhaps God is delighted by our delight. You're not going to find the perfect metaphor, no matter how hard you search for it. Nevertheless, it is in the searching for God that we find God in three persons again and again. And so that human impulse to ask why is itself a holy thing. Something given to us by God as the means by which we grow closer to God. It is the grace given to us uniquely to move out beyond base survival and reproduction to move in a world where we recognize ourselves as individuals, but individuals who are in relationship with each other and with the God who created us, sustains us, and sanctifies us. If you feel now, as I'm coming to the end of my little sermon, that you do not have a better understanding of the Holy Trinity than you did when I began, then I would say that I've done my job. <laughs> For it is not my job to explain this mystery to you, to give it to you in bite-sized pieces, palatable and easy to digest like an apple cut in three. Instead, it is my job to tell you that in seeking God, you find God. That in pondering the stuff of God, we are lifted up to more questions, not pinned down to answers. If our hearts burn within us, thinking on God, then we have done well in God's sight, I'm sure. I want to close by saying this. The greatest and most formidable work on the Holy Trinity was written by St. Augustine of Hippo in the 5th century. It comprises 15 volumes and has chapter titles like this. How there is a trinity in the very simplicity of God, whether and how the trinity that is God is manifested from the trinities which have been shown to be in men. It is a dense work, <laughs> written by one of, if not the finest theological mind the Church has ever known. There's a story that shortly after St. Augustine had finished the last of his 15 volumes on the trinity, he had a dream in which he was walking along a beach and he came upon a small child who had dug a hole in the sand and was contentedly filling it with water from the ocean. And in his dream, Augustine walked over to this boy and he said, silly boy, you'll never put the whole ocean in that little hole of yours. The boy looked back at him and said, silly Augustine, you'll never put the Trinity in those little books of yours. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>